Hello, and welcome to the lecture on Chapter 24, the topic of black holes and curved spacetime. Okay, so let's get to this content, which is both heavy, literally, and figuratively. All right, so when we talk about black holes, we've probably heard of them, and we're going to be talking about the theory that leads to their understanding. Okay, a lot of connected ideas here, but what better place to start than looking at evidence of a black hole? Okay. Now this is evidence in the visible spectrum, okay? Because it turns out that when black holes exist in binary star systems, and remember binary star systems are very common, well, then you have a X-ray emission from that black hole because the black hole is pulling matter. Remember, black holes have a huge gravitational force, okay? And this, and the matter, the matter is being, maybe being pulled off because the star is so nearby. Maybe there's a strong solar wind that's um, that's blowing some matter kind of off or in the direction of the black hole. But when the matter gets close enough to the black hole, it then starts to spiral inward. All right, that's what we're seeing. And this spiraling inward disk emits X-rays because it's so hot because the gas is at temperatures of tens of millions of Kelvin degrees and is emitting black body radiation, not to be confused with black holes, that's just the radiation from solid objects. Like I emit black body radiation, but in the much, much longer, lower energy infrared spectrum, these are X-rays, these are very short wavelength, high energy photons, high energy light, okay? And I bring that up because remember, the, the whole idea about light is we can get light in certain spectrums and that spectrum tells the story, but sometimes there's different explanations for the same spectrum. In this case, the X-rays that we're seeing, the X-ray source of this disk is because of the temperature. Now, another, another reason we might see X-rays is because of very fast acceleration. All right, so in the case of, of um, supernovas, X-rays are emitted because of, of fast acceleration. In the case of neutron stars colliding, which we'll touch on in the very last topic in this, in this chapter, the, the, the cause is not because of high steady temperature of a dense gas behaving like a solid, like this disk, but instead is because of fast acceleration, okay? But this disk is hot and emits X-rays. And some of that matter is going to get trapped inside the black hole itself, never to leave, okay? That matter will collapse into something called the singularity when it passes past the point of no return called the event horizon. The event horizon, ha event horizon having a defined radius called the Schwarzschild radius, which is dependent on the mass that has collapsed into the singularity. Okay? So, that's the idea. Now, does all the matter fall into the black hole? No. Some of it is energized so much in that super hot disk that it, and directed by the magnetic field that it gets ejected in jets away from the axis of rotation of the spiraling disk that is emitting x-rays. It's an x-ray source, okay? So these are observations that astronomers make of light coming from black holes. We'll learn that there's other observations that come, can come from black holes that don't involve light at all, which is quite interesting, okay? Now, I, let me repeat, there are a lot of big ideas in this chapter, so I highly recommend that you read the chapter and take some time to see how these big ideas are connected. But point being, this is detection of an X-ray. These are stellar mass X-rays, all right? Um, excuse me, stellar mass black holes, which means that they are um, black holes that have masses that are just a few times the mass of our sun, okay? So, you know, 10 or 12 times the mass of our sun. Okay, all right? So we're going to talk now about a theory from Albert Einstein, Okay, famous physicist, obviously very well known, kind of this iconic, bigger than life name in science. Now, there are multiple theories and discoveries that are attributed to Einstein, but we're talking about one of his, I would say lesser known theories, because we're not talking about E equals MC squared, but we're, instead we're talking about his general theory of relativity. His general theory of relativity, okay? Which you'll see is basically his curved space-time theory, if you want to give it a catchy name. So curved space-time theory. The fact that it is a, 
that it has a connection to his earlier theory, which is called the special theory of relativity, is, and they're both theories of relativity, is because they're both, both based on the same principle that light has one speed and that speed is unchanging, all right? So the speed of light is always C and that can never vary, all right? And that has two different consequences depending on whether you're moving in a straight line or you're moving in a curved path, okay? All right, and here we're talking about the curved path case, which is the more complicated case, All right? So to not get in the special, special relativity because we don't need it for the chapter, let's continue on talking about general relativity, also known as the general theory of relativity, okay? So the general theory of relativity, to understand it, we should start by discussing acceleration because the idea behind the theory is that acceleration and gravity are indistinguishable, okay? So, okay, so acceleration and gravity are indistinguishable, okay? You cannot tell them apart. So, to give a comparison to an everyday system like an elevator, if I'm in an elevator and the elevator is moving at a constant rate, then I have my normal weight. And I could say, oh, that weight is due to gravity. If the elevator accelerates upwards, then I would be heavier than normal. And then I could say, oh, is that because I'm on a different planet and this planet just has more mass than Earth and I'm just heavier? Or is it because I'm just on an elevator and the elevator is going up? Well, of course, common sense would tell you it's just because you're on an elevator and the elevator is going up. But the two effects, being on a planet with greater gravitational acceleration or being in an elevator, would be indistinguishable. You can't tell them apart. Likewise, if you're in an elevator that's going down, that's accelerating down, because constant velocity, there would be no change in your weight. But if the elevator is accelerating down, A for acceleration, then you would feel lighter in the elevator. The scale would have a lower reading. And again, that may be because the elevator is accelerating down between floors, or maybe that's because you're on a planet or a moon of less gravitational acceleration. For example, if you go to the moon, the gravitational acceleration there is one-sixth that on Earth, so you'd weigh one-sixth as much. So if you're in a, a box and you don't know if it's an elevator or a, spa you know, a, um, a space base on the moon, a moon base, then you can't tell the difference. Maybe you're in a moon base, maybe you're in an elevator, okay? That's the idea. There is no difference. And in the case of free fall, you are either being pulled down and are going to crash into Earth below because you're being gravitationally accelerated downwards, or you're weightless because there's no gravity nearby. Maybe you're in deep space and you can't tell the difference between free fall and impending crash or being off so far from any planet or star that there is effectively no gravity and you're just truly floating, okay? And that's illustrated also with this idea and one of my favorite lines in the book, two people play catch as they descend into a bottomless abyss, okay? So these people here, as they play catch, they would play it differently than two people who are not descending into a bottomless abyss because in order to pass the ball back and forth, they would have to throw it straight. And then they would successfully make the toss. From our point of view, if the bottomless abyss had glass sides and we were looking at it from the side, then we would see that the path doesn't take a straight path, the ball doesn't take a straight path, but instead takes a curved path as it passes between them, right? In other words, the ball is falling with them. There's no air resistance here, by the way, okay? It's a vacuum, vacuum abyss. So, Here's the thing. When they play catch like that, they would be aware that they're playing differently than they would on Earth. Now, again, they may be playing catch like that because they're falling and they're being gravitationally accelerated down by a gravitational acceleration, which is G, or they may be playing catch this way because they're drifting in deep space and they're not actually falling at all because there is no gravity. There would be no difference in both cases it would either be acceleration or no gravity, but it would be the ability to play catch by tossing the ball in a straight line 
rather than an arced line like we're used to, right? Because you normally play catch, you got to throw the ball up so it actually makes it somewhere, right? Otherwise, of course, it won't land at the height it started at, okay? So that's the idea, indistinguishable here between no gravity or free fall. Same thing here, okay? Astronauts in the International Space Station are in free fall. Now here you might be like, wait, the elevator, we made this idea that, oh, the elevator is bad news because it's going to crash and hit the ground. Well, is it, but why doesn't this, why don't, if the space station is really free fall, which it is, then there's another question we've got to quickly address here. Why doesn't the space station just hit the ground? That's because the space station has a, a very fast sideways velocity. Because you consider the elevator, the elevator had no sideways velocity, right? It was just moving straight down. Now, the space station is falling straight down, right? Just like the elevator but it's also moving really fast to the side. And it's moving so fast to the side that by the time it's fallen a certain distance, free fall acceleration, just accelerating right, right down, the Earth has curved out underneath it. That's what a stable satellite orbit is. That's what, that's what engineers do when they shoot up satellites, whether it's a communication satellite, or they're shooting up you know, docking um, you know, probes with people in them that are taking them to the International Space Station. They set up that trajectory, they fire the final rockets, and make sure that, they had, that that satellite has the direction and velocity necessary to never hit the ground, to make sure it's moving fast enough in its free fall that as it falls, the Earth curves out underneath it. All right? That's the idea. Right? And it takes about, about 6,000 or 6,500 meters per second to do it. That's how fast. So six and a half kilometers per second is how fast the National Space Station has to move so that it never hits the ground. Okay? But it is in free fall. All right, so we got the, the fact out of the way that we don't have to worry about hitting the ground because it's moving to the side, okay? But still, free fall. But those, you know, astronauts inside, all these scientists and astronauts that are in the International Space Station, right? They know that they're in free fall. They know that the reason that things float in the air is because everything is falling together and because it's like playing catch in the bottomless abyss where you have to, play by different rules than you would just on the surface of the earth. If you, taught, if you want to toss something, you just throw it in a straight path, okay? Now here's the thing. If they didn't know, right? If they, if they just woke up in the space station and they didn't realize where they were, they'd either realize that they're in a space station that is falling, hopefully falling in an orbit and not just going to fall into the atmosphere and burn up, okay? But they're either in, in a space station that is influenced by gravity orbiting something, all right, or falling towards something, and there's gravity, okay? It's influenced by gravity, like I said. Or they're in a space station that is way off in deep space and is influenced by no gravity. Because in both cases, everything would be weightless, just like that. They couldn't tell the difference between the two, okay? So that is one of the principles behind Einstein's theory of general relativity, okay? Is that there is equivalence between acceleration and gravity, okay? So there's equivalence between acceleration and gravity. You can't tell them apart. Okay, and this, by the way, is in addition to the postulate that light always travels at the same speed in every reference frame which was basically the, entire of his, the entirety of his special theory of relativity and is now just one, of the, one part of general relativity, okay? But here's equivalence, okay? Acceleration and gravity can't tell the difference between them. All right, so that's fine so far. You know, we've said, okay, so that's okay. So you throw a ball straight path back and forth. Great, you know, you can't tell if, it's, if you're just out in deep space or you're falling. Fine. Okay, but here's where things get weird because now what if that ball is instead a beam of light, like a laser, okay? Well, the equivalence principle, the equivalence postulate, part of the general theory of relativity, says that no experiment can be performed in that space station to tell if it is freely falling in orbit or if it's off in deep space. No experiment, including experiments that involve light. Well, here's the thing. If light behaves like we think it did up until the general theory of relativity, then that actually would show the difference. And let's say why, right? So here is a space shuttle, and it's in orbit around Earth, 
it's in free fall, but it's in orbit, so it's moving you know, fast to the side. Its path relative to Earth is a curved path. That means that if we shoot a beam of light and it starts off on its way from the back of the shuttle to the front, uh, the, I guess the cargo bay back here, right? then what should happen is the shuttle should turn a little bit to follow its orbit, and the light, since light travels in a straight line, the light should not turn, which means the light should hit point B prime, okay? Because it will not travel in a straight line relative to the shuttle, because it has to travel in a straight line relative to, you know, a fixed point. Hmm, a fixed point, okay? Because here's the thing, right? This straight line is what? This straight line is straight relative to Earth, okay? But it's definitely not straight relative to the shuttle because a straight line relative to the shuttle would start here, okay, right here, and it would end right here. And then that point, of course, would be right here. But that would mean that the light would have to curve. But it does. The light does curve, okay? Because if it didn't, then there wouldn't be equivalence. Then you'd right away, you'd have an experiment. You'd be like, oh, you're shining, you're shining beam of light. You'd have some sort of laser detector. And then you'd realize that the light got deflected. You're like, oh, well, in that case, I'm in free fall orbit. I'm not in distant space with no gravity. Done. You know the difference between acceleration and gravity. But the idea is you can't tell the difference. Okay? So that means that the light must curve. Okay? But can light curve? Well, maybe, right? I mean... The, space, the shuttle here is curving, after all. So what would be special about the light curving? Well, here's the thing. Light is not matter. In fact, light has no matter. So unlike the space shuttle or the ball that was being tossed back and forth in the abyss or even the, the fruit um, you know, floating in the International Space Station, those are all things that have matter. They're composed of atoms, right? Light isn't. Light is completely devoid of matter. It is a fundamentally different type of physical phenomenon. It's, it's a wave particle. It travels at a fixed speed, regardless of your reference frame. And if it has no matter, then it can't be affected by gravity, right? Because gravity pulls on matter. It's an attractive force between matter. That was Newton's law of universal gravitation, okay? And that was our understanding of gravity up until, you know, Einstein here at the turn of the 20th century, early 1900s. So then how would the light curve if it's not being pulled on by gravity? Well, that's because this path is, like I said, it's straight. But it's straight relative to what? To some, you know, absolute straight line? You know, is there some, there's some like, you know, official map of the universe? And, there's, and this, this is a straight line? You know, there's, the, there's like the background grid of the universe? You know what I mean? I mean, because everything is moving in the universe, right? So is there, is there, are there fixed points in the universe, things that aren't moving? Well, no. And there's nothing that isn't relative to something else. There is no such thing as being truly in a straight line. And what Einstein did, what his genius was, was, was that he was able to run with that idea and come up with the idea that space-time is, is a bunch of curves and large concentrations of matter curve the fabric of space and time but it's not space and time because space and time are two sides of the same coin and so gravity curves the fabric of space time and we'll see some analogies of that in just a moment so what's happening is the light is taking a straight path in its own reference frame but that path is curved because space time is curved Okay, but it's still the most direct path through that curved space time. Curved because of gravity. Okay, so here's the analogy an ant walking across, or walking across a rubber sheet. If there's no dent in our rubber sheet, which represents space time, then the, the ant takes a straight path. The ant is our light. It takes the straightest path possible, okay? However, if we put a paperweight, maybe representing a neutron star, a high, highly concentrated locale of matter, then our rubber sheet is bent and our most direct path for our ant slash light 
is to go way down into the curve and back out of it. Okay? And that has affected the path of the ant. It's affected the path of the light that the ant represents. It's affected how long it takes for the ant to make the trip. Okay? And it allows for equivalence to work. Because now there is no way to tell. Because light does appear to take bent paths because space-time itself forces the direct path to become bent. Okay, right? So now when we will talk about some of the more of the consequences because, you know, it is a longer path after all now, right? What does that mean? Well, that is going to affect the passage of time, how much time it takes ant, clearly longer, okay? And it's going to, it's going to affect the the way the light looks when it comes back out, right? Okay, now that might not work for the analogy of the, lamp, the ant, but you'll see how it works for light, okay? So that's the curvature of space-time, and I know it's a, it's a strange idea, but think what it's done for us. It's allowed us to think about a, an idea that gravity and acceleration are indistinguishable. And did it have to be right? No. But it was a set of ideas that could be followed to a natural conclusion and a testable natural conclusion, okay? Because the theory could have been wrong. It, it, could, it could be that maybe there really was an equivalence. Maybe, maybe there really was a fundamental difference between artificial gravity, which is acceleration, and true gravity. And that, that would have led to a whole cascade of other consequences. But, I, but Einstein didn't think so because it turned out that, although not, not intuitively, that those consequences were even more troubling. Okay? And so this idea of space-time being curved, of matter affecting space and time, well, it's, it was certainly, you know, uncharted territory, but it was testable, and if correct, then could lead to some better understanding of the universe. Okay? So, it started to be tested, okay? Now, one of the first tests, all right, and this is, the, this is your um, section 24.3, Tests of General Relativity, okay? And I know I've spent a, a while, hopefully, helping you understand kind of what's the motivation behind relativity, okay? Concentrations of matter lead to a bending of space-time, causes light to take a curved path, okay? Well, the tests, I don't want to spend forever on them, but there's a couple of interesting ones. One has to do with the orbit of Mercury, Essentially, Mercury's orbit was, was changing due to poles of other planets, but it was changing more than scientists had predicted due to those accurately measured poles of other planets. But once you took into account that, this, that the sun bent the fabric of space-time and then should change how fast time passes for Mercury and thus affect its orbit as observed from outside of, you know, of its orbit, then the numbers matched up, okay? And this is kind of an indirect measurement. It's saying, okay, well, we have a, we have a discrepancy here in our, our theory and our measurements. But if we take this other far out theory into account, well, it turns out our measurements are better. Okay, that, that's great. You know, that, that, that helps lead some validity to a new theory, like the general theory of relativity. But there was better to come. Because in 1919, after Einstein published his theory of general relativity, a total solar eclipse was happening in kind of a, the southern hemisphere crossing over Brazil and other, other locations. And measurements were made during that total solar eclipse of light that otherwise would be obscured from the very bright sun, but was visible because the sun was blocked out by the moon and thus very little light was reaching Earth, you know, other than the much dimmer corona of the sun, its upper atmosphere. So this light then that we then could see due to the total solar eclipse for a couple of minutes at these particular locations was measured very accurately and found to indeed be bending. The light was bending, all right? Now, the, the measurement ended up only being about, you know, 20% accurate to general, general theory of relativity, but it was a bend in light, something that no other theory predicted at all, okay? All right? So sure, it wasn't, you know, it's, it's hard to make the measurements quite right, you know, but they were repeated over and over again, and the accuracy got much better down to 1% agreement with general, general relativity of future solar eclipses. So yeah, this, this was actually a really big moment. You know, I, I'd say that E equals mc squared is more associated with Einstein today, but that's special relativity. 
This theory in 1919 was published that year and then tested later that year in, in, in Brazil during the total solar eclipse. Well, that's really what, what made Einstein a household name, interestingly. You know, not being alive in, in the 1920s, it's hard to think of like that, you know, that being the moment, but that, that was the moment that, that really captured the, a, lot, a lot of attention you know, internationally. And we had, we had the name of Einstein was known throughout the world after, after that point. All right. All right. And it's still known today. His, you know, his fame stuck around. OK, but the, but certainly general rel- relativity, this, uh, you know, this idea that, you know, there's equivalence between acceleration and gravity. That's that's not well understood. Right. Even though the name Einstein is immediately associated with science and usually physics. Right. OK. All right. So here we have confirmation of general relativity, the bending of light due to concentrations of matter. OK. Um, and. Further confirmations, you know, this is um, during a, a Viking, um, which was a, a lander on Mars. As the, as the lander was sending radio waves back to Earth, it was obvious that they were, they were taking longer than they should have based on the distance. And that's because the distance wasn't this long, but instead had to go down into the dip that was the bending of the fabric of space-time due to the sun. And that actually lengthened the time for the signals. It lengthened the delay, which is many minutes between Earth communicating with the Viking spacecraft, okay? And so that, but it could be accounted for. That, that, that delay was exactly accounted for, okay? So before we go on then to talk about where this, where this goes, you know, but I'll, let me say, you know, because the reason we're talking about general relativity is because bending of space-time is going to be most pronounced when you have really concentrated bits of matter, okay? Think the neutron stars that we've talked about already, or even white dwarfs, much, much denser than the sun, Okay? So they're going to have a much more concentrated bend. You know, it's going to be a deeper divot in space-time, right? You're going to have a divot that goes way down there, okay? So that's where, that's where we're leading with this. And ultimately, we're going to talk about a black hole, which is a divot so deep that it just never ends. It truly is that abyss. It's an abyss in the fabric of space-time itself. A rip, maybe. A tear. A hole. Okay? In space-time. So that's where we're going, right? That's, the, that's kind of the motivation for all this. The, the idea of... of, of spending all this time trying to explain the basics of general relativity, okay? Because we can't really think about a good understanding of a black hole without general relativity. Otherwise, it's, we have a very cursory understanding of a black hole. It's just a kind of couple of talking points, but no, maybe no deeper understanding. So furthermore, we want, we want to think about this idea that does general relativity matter beyond black, black holes? You know, because if, it, if we are having a a change in the time it takes light to go with it, you know, because it has to take a longer path. You know, does, does, this, does this show up outside of the, the very obscure exotic idea of black holes? And yes, it does. When we look at light passing, toward, passing near massive objects, we actually see, see the light experience a gravitational redshift. Now, we've talked about red, redshifts before. A redshift, and it's a good, good, remind, good reminder here, a redshift is the idea that all the wavelengths of light are shifted to longer wavelengths. So, you know, maybe like a known frequency, like the frequency of hydrogen, is, is length is, the frequency is going to be increased. Thus the, and the, the way, well, the, fre- the frequency is gonna be reduced and the wavelength is gonna be increased. That's a redshift. And that, that's when things are moving away from us. All right, so it's a longer, longer wavelength. And it's longer wavelength because the idea is that the speed of life is fixed and wavelength times frequency is speed. And since C can never change, if you change F, you have to change lambda, okay? Well, gravitational redshift is a redshift, but instead of something moving away from us, it's a redshift in light just because light passed near something massive. So it's actually a totally you know, different cause of a light phenomenon. It's almost, to bring it back to the very first slide, it's almost the idea like about x-rays, right? You can have x-rays because you have something really hot, and you can have x-rays because something's moving really fast. You know, so totally, totally different things causing the same emission, the same observation, that an astronomer can make with the right detector, okay? So here, detecting maybe something that's been shifted to longer visible light or in the infrared or even just less ultraviolet, whatever it may be, but shifted to longer wavelength, okay? And that happens when light passes towards, you know, or by or past massive objects. We see a gravitational redshift. And that's because the frequency has decreased because the time has been lengthened, okay? And lambda must go up. So what do I mean by the time lengthening? What I mean is that time runs 
faster the closer you are to a gravitational source. And it runs slower the further away you are. So if you're close to a gravitational source, your clocks will run slightly faster. As you move away, the clocks run slower. So think the movie Interstellar, if you've seen it. If you haven't, that's fine. But they land on a planet that's near a black hole. One hour for them is like one year for someone back on Earth because their clocks are running that much faster, okay? Because they're closer to the gravitational source, all right? And it actually ends up mattering for satellites. The accuracy necessary for, for satellites like GPS to work well, to be able to triangulate by sending signals at, with nanosecond accuracy, has to take into account that time runs slower in orbit, just a few hundred kilometers above the surface of Earth. Now, I mean very far, and Earth not even being that massive, but that small difference in the accuracy required actually means that all those satellites take into account general relativity. They honestly do. And if they didn't, they wouldn't be as accurate as they are. We wouldn't have GPS the way we have it based on satellites if it wasn't for actually programming in the fact that, this, that their clocks run slower than clocks at the surface of Earth. Remarkable, isn't it? Okay? All right. So, now let's talk about the exotic applications of general relativity. Onward to black holes, okay? So, here we have the idea of someone maybe, you know, approaching a massive object or maybe standing on a neutron star as it collapses, as the collapse, into a black hole. The idea then is that that neutron star has all of its matter concentrated to one point, the singularity. Now, the singularity doesn't need general relativity because the singularity just states that there's no pressure to push back against gravity because up to this point we had neutron degeneracy pressure holding the neutron star together. But when that quantum mechanical pressure is overcome by crushing gravitational pressure, there's nothing to stop. The gravity will just continue to crush the matter and it will apparently just go down to a single point. But then there will be a radius that will be defined by general relativity. So the singularity could be a totally, an idea alone from general relativity. But it turns out that there's actually a defined radius called the event horizon that requires general relativity to calculate, okay? And the event horizon of the black hole is really one of the things that we can even calculate in this class because it ends up being a rather, the final form of the, of the final version of the formula ends up being quite easy to work with, okay? So first of all, we keep using black hole. Well, the term was actually popularized by a brilliant physicist described here, John Wheeler, all right? Who's much more a contemporary physicist, all right? Born, you know, at, you know after Einstein was already, already, you know, publishing his works, okay? obviously not becoming an active physicist until much later, okay? Um, here, I, I would guess that he is rubbing his belly and patting his head, at, you know? So he's obviously a very skilled human being in, one, in more, than, more than one way, okay? So he popularized the term black hole, right? So that's a term we use today and made a lot of breakthroughs about understanding it, much of which will be on, beyond the scope of the class. But one thing we do want to understand about general relativity and how it applies to black holes is a very fascinating idea. And that is the curvature of light's path. Because imagine this person standing on a new, maybe this is, you know, this is, this is a normal star. Well, on a normal star, light, light is able to escape because light is moving, after all, at the speed of light, which is the, the C is speed of light, and that's three times 10 to the eight meters per second, okay? And the idea is if that if the gravity's not that great, then that's, you know, light can easily escape and you know, it takes off in all directions. That's the shining of the star. But for really massive stars like neutron stars, the mass has become so great that the escape velocity, the gravitational escape velocity is approaching the speed of light. So that means that a lot of paths of the light don't have a large enough component this would be like the, you know, the component that this one here that is actually perpendicular to the surface. That component isn't large enough to actually overcome the gravitational escape velocity or to achieve the gravitational escape velocity necessary. So all that light just 
comes back down. Okay, it just curves right back down. Okay, and it's curving down because space time is curved, not because light has matter. You know, because generally when we talk about escape velocity, we're talking about, you know, things that have matter having escape velocity, like maybe a dust particle or an atom for that matter. Okay? And that's fine. You can, you know, then you can say, okay, well then there, maybe there are objects that are, you know, so massive that their escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. But then that means that nothing could escape. Okay? But then could light still escape, you know, because light doesn't have matter? Well, no, because light follows a direct path, but that path gets curved. So for a neutron star, it turns out maybe the only path for a neutron star that's just about to collapse, the only path would be light that is shown straight up. So light still escapes, but only the light that happens to be directed straight up. And all the other photons, all the other wave packets of light that go off in different directions, they're trapped. All right? But then they'll you know, reflect off each other, get, you know, maybe new light will get created through physical processes, right? They're basically the acceleration of a charge. Every time that happens, there's light created. And there, you know, there's be more light that's directed straight up and then is able to escape. But then what happens when the neutron star collapses and becomes a black hole? Now there is no path. This path is gone. Instead, this path, the straight up path, would actually curve back on, over on itself and come right back down. So every path would curve. And that is such an amazing thing to visualize because now we have something that is impossible to visualize in three dimensions which makes it fun to even think about. Because you have to imagine something where the path is curved over on itself even though it's going straight up. Where does it go then? Well, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a divot in space-time anymore. It's like a pocket. It's a, it's a curve with no way out. Okay? And then that's how general relativity allows us to come up with that point where space-time is curved so that light can never escape. And that limit of the black hole's effect on light not escaping is the Schwarzschild radius, named after this man here, okay? Working much earlier than you know, the previous physicist, okay, working in the, um, you know, more like a contemporary of Einstein. And actually his work coming up with the Schwarzschild radius um, was, was, his, was published at the end of his life and was the first um, analytical um, kind of result coming out of general relativity. He was the first person to, you know, really apply it mathematically and make the equations work. Einstein later made the equations work within his own theory, but Schwarzschild did it first, right? So it's called the Schwarzschild radius. Okay, and this is the radius of the event horizon. And that is the point of no return. Not to be confused with the singularity. The singularity exists because the matter collapses to a single point. But general relativity gives us the event horizon. So we got collapsing to a single point by basically classical physics. And then the idea of a escape velocity for light radius given by general relativity, the curvature of space-time, okay? And there's no way to know what goes on beyond the event horizon because nothing can escape. Information is transmitted by light. Radio waves are light. Bluetooth is light, right? Everything that is information is light. So nothing can escape. No information. There's no way to know what goes on, in, on beyond the event horizon. There's no, there's no way to know if the singularity is truly a singularity. What is inside there? It's impossible to know, okay? And then if you approach a black hole, time will start, will, will move so differently for you. It will run, you know, that these, that, you know, the passage of time for you, you know, will be, you know, so like, you know, one hour as if you were able to get close to a black hole might be a hundred years for someone that isn't close to that black hole, right? So it's sort of like, so from, from the point of view of someone far away from the black hole, it looks like the matter would approach, but never even, never even cross the event horizon because the time starts to become infinitely different, the passage of time, okay? So, those are, those are you know, that's, that's the idea. That's the general relativity explanation of black holes, a pocket in the space-time continuum, a 
a curvature that's, that's curved back over on itself, allowing nothing to escape. So it is less of a rip, less than a hole, less of a hole, and more of just a strange, impossible to imagine curve over. Almost, you know, almost like a, a Mobius strip of space-time, something that, that, that is curved back over on itself. So what are the, what are the you know, last things we want, want to say about black holes where we um, touch on our, our, our kind of our final, um, final topic? Well, you know, as we, as we started with the opening slide is that we can, we can detect them through their X-ray emission when they're in a binary star system because of, this, because of the disk that forms around them, okay? But there's another way we can, we can talk about evidence of black holes, and that does touch on our final topic, and that is the topic of gravitational waves, okay? Gravitational waves. And one thing I'll say about black holes before we do gra the finish up with gravitational waves is that we are, we are focusing on these stellar mass black, black holes, these black holes that, you know, have, have masses in the range of, you know, 9 or 12, more usually right, right around 10, you know, like really kind of, right, let's just, you know, because if we're saying that, you know, neutron stars can really be up to six solar masses, okay? That's, that's your limit on, on mass. So neutron star mass is always going to be less than six solar masses. So anything greater than that is going to be a black hole. And the observa observations have confirmed that. We found these, these black holes in binary star systems. And they're going to be bigger. So, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? You know, these are our, our we call them stellar mass black holes. But there are other types of black holes, these supermassive black holes, these ones that continue to feed, feed on thousands of stars. And we will talk about those later when we talk about galaxies because those are galactic-level phenomena, right? And it's amazing, right, that... And maybe that's even something more captivating all this discussion about general relativity, that black holes can just keep growing, right? Okay? But we're not there yet. That's okay. But what I do want to talk about is this idea of gravitational waves that finish up this lecture. Because gravitational waves are another way to look at black holes. Now, it's amazing. A gravitational wave is like a ripple in the space-time continuum. Because if we think about you know, our analogy of the rubber sheet and the ant bending it, well... When we drop that paperweight on the rubber sheet, if we lower it carefully, then yeah, we just kind of slowly stretch out the sheet. But if we drop it fast, then the sheet's going to reverberate and it's going to send ripples throughout the sheet, won't it? Those are gravitational waves. When there's a sudden change in mass in some location in the space-time continuum, that sudden change in the curvature of space-time must send out energy as ripples throughout the entire universe. And we then we should be able to measure those gravitational waves the same way we measure electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves, whether they're radio waves or light waves, you know, visible light waves, or infrared or ultraviolet or X-rays or gamma rays. You know, those are all electromagnetic waves, right? And we measure those depending on then the use of the appropriate detection device, depending on the wavelength and frequency. Okay? But what about gravitational waves? Well, we're just now in the last five years, just since 2015. Gravitational waves have been confirmed. We can actually measure them. We can measure ripples in space-time because gravitational waves are much, much weaker than electromagnetic waves, and they are very hard to detect. The quick explanation of how we detect them is, de is these detectors, these gravitational wave detectors that have very long tubes that make an L, and they're sending light back and forth down these tubes, and if the light arrives out of phase at the detector, then that means that one tube was slightly lengthened or contracted because Earth was in the path of a gravitational ripple. And as that gravitational ripple passed through Earth, everything changed size. But it changed size by a fraction, a, a, a millionth of the diameter of an atom, right? A tiny, tiny fraction, a trillionth of the diameter of an atom. So, so to measure such a tiny change in the size of the planet and everything on it is incredibly difficult. But really, since 2015 and then mo most recently in 2017 when the, when the prototype phase of these gravitational detectors was finished, they're operational and they're working. And scientists are discovering sources of gravitational ripples. And the first ones were collisions between black holes. And interestingly, the collisions between black holes emitted only energy 
as gravitational waves. No electromagnetic waves were associated with the vents, which is remarkable, but also kind of left maybe a, a lack of confirmation because there's this event that we can only detect one way. How do we know it's really happening? Well, most recently in 2017, we have detected the collisions between neutron stars, not just black holes. And when neutron stars collide, if you recall, they emit gamma rays, gamma rays, okay, which are light, high energy light. Those are the gamma ray sources we talked about in the previous chapter. Well, those gamma ray sources are electromagnetic radiation. And so then we have an event with confirmed gamma ray emission and gravitational wave emission, where the gravitational wave emission matches the model of the neutron stars based on their masses. We're really detecting gravitational waves and the accuracy is just getting better. And it, it is, it is impossible to overstate what a big deal that is and how we're just talking about five years. I mean, it's, it's literally like we've discovered a whole new tool and like a whole new way of seeing the universe. Fundamentally, gravitational waves, very faint, very hard to detect, but are an entirely new source of energy because they do carry energy. That ripple in the space-time continuum, which is so far out to think about, carries energy with it. One, one way, in fact, that they were indirectly observed is because black holes, when they orbit each other, will spiral inwards because they're losing energy because that energy is dissipated in the gravitational wave ripples, you know, traveling out through space-time, right? So it, it is, I mean, just considering everything that we do with the electromagnetic spectrum, the fact that we use the electromagnetic spectrum for our communications, we use it for our vision, you know, we've, you know as animals, we evolved to use it for vision. There's, you know, this the, in, in un, uncomprehensible, this like range of things we do with the electromagnetic spectrum. And now to think that the gravitational wave spectrum is a whole new spectrum of energy, entirely new, entirely divorced from light, entirely divorced from light. Think about what we, what we can do with it. Think about how that's going to help us understand things like dark matter and dark energy. Okay? Things that don't use light in their processes, right? That we're still just, you know, beginning to understand. Okay? So remarkable stuff. And the last thing I'll leave you with, which is just a fun fact, is that these neutron star collisions and the gamma, and the, not gamma, well, in addition to gamma rays, but the gravitational waves that were detected from the collision between those neutron stars, you know, massive change in, in space-time continuum, that afterwards when the, the spectrum was analyzed around the collision of the neutron stars, the, the associated emission of many heavy elements was detected. Very, very many heavy, heavy elements, in, including huge amounts of gold. And up to this point, you know, astronomers had speculated maybe gold are created during supernovas, but the energy, the energy levels never matched up. But now we see that gold, platinum as well, are produced primarily, we think now, through the collision of neutron stars. That's, that's you know, all the gold that we have in, you know, the little deposits, you know, throughout the crust of our own planet, right? Our own mundane planet that we, you know, take for granted. That came through the, the previous collisions of neutron stars at some point. All right? So I'll leave you with that, that legacy to think about as we conclude our lecture on general relativity and black holes. Thank you so much for watching.